Very good morning to everybody here at Mountain View Church. Welcome to our 930 service. I just want to say we had such a wonderful Resurrection Sunday last week. And as I was thinking about the songs to, to play the week following Resurrection Sunday, um, you'll, you'll wonder why we're going to play this song. But remember, before Jesus rose from the dead, they didn't get it, did they? They just did not get it. They're like, okay, you say you're going to die, but what does that really mean? Well, he meant he was going to die, right? But then they got it. They got it after he rose from the dead, and everything changed. And that happens with all of us too, right? Before we come to Christ, we're, we're, we're lost. We don't get it. And then at some point, the light of, the, of Christ and his word comes into our life. And, and that's what this song's about. So let's stand and have some fun with this song, huh? Yeah. All right. I wanted to aim this like me the sin. I would have left my disabled friend. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. Praise the Lord. I saw the light. I saw the light. I saw the light. No more in darkness. No more in night. Now I'm so happy. No sorrow in sight. Oh, praise the Lord. I saw the light. Just like a blind man, I wandered along. Where even fear that came for my own. Then like a blind man, they got me back in line. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise Still will follow. 
Amen, amen. You may be seated. Welcome to our 930 worship service here. So glad to have all of you come out and fellowship with us today to worship with us today. Uh, there's a scripture found in 1 Corinthians 16, 14, where it says, let all that you do be done in love. Let all that you do be done in love. And we are doing what we're doing here today because of love, right? We love him because he first loved us. Amen. So it's love in the house today. Amen? All right. Hey, guys, if you grab your communication sheet, there's some information in there that I'd like to share with you. Uh, of course, uh, the spoken live concert that will be here at Mountain View Church. Brother Derek, will you come and share more information on that, please? Good morning. Good morning. Next Sunday, there's an awesome opportunity for young people of all ages to come out and to hear live Christian rock music. Not that these guys are not rocking it right now, so I, and I really appreciate them, but Spoken is, a, um, is an award-winning Christian rock group that's been around for 20 years, and they're going to come out here and uh, really show us a, a good time. It's going to be um, next Sunday, 6 p.m. It's going to be absolutely free, so if you know any high schoolers, um, any middle schoolers, any college age young people, please invite them on out and they'll enjoy a, um, a great rock concert. So um, if anyone wants to uh, invite them, tell them to come on out. If anybody wants to help out, um, just see me afterwards and uh, we'd love to have your help. So um, let's um, bring the people out for, um, for Spoken. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Amen. And, of course, uh, the ladies and girls ages 10 and up afternoon tea party. And I believe there is something out there in the foyer with that information on there uh, for the ladies and the girls to sign up for that. And uh, their guest speaker will be Cindy Monroe. Tremendous, tremendous uh, speaker. And uh, I know that the ladies are looking forward to that. Now, um, something that I've put off on for quite some time and of course, I'm going to blame COVID for it, right? We're blaming COVID for everything. So I'm just going to jump in there and blame COVID for this as well. But uh, we've been having starting point classes for uh, the past two years. So I really can't blame COVID for, for uh, the year before. But many of you that have gone through our starting point class and have turned in your information, I have yet to, to officially welcome you into our Mountain View family. And so I'm going to be doing that next Sunday. And uh, so if, if you have been in our starting point class and have yet to turn in uh, your packet, if you want to become a part of this Mountain View family, make sure that you get that turned in because we don't want to uh, exclude anyone. We want to make sure. But we've had some folks that have joined or, or has been to our starting point class but have yet to turn in their their uh, information, but they, they still want to come and fellowship with us, and, and that's good also. But for those that have turned in their information, that is to become officially members of this uh, ministry called Mountain View Church. And so we're going to be doing that next Sunday. So guys, let us go to the Lord and ask for his blessings on this time as we come together to continue to worship him and to uh, take up the offerings right now. Father, I just pray right now that as we continue to worship you, 
to honor you, to praise you in love, dear Lord, as uh, the word teaches us in 1 Corinthians 16, 14, that everything that we do, we do it in love. And so, Father, even as we gather together in love, I pray, Father, that our fellowship, our praise, our prayer, our giving, and even as we open up your word, be done in love. And Father, I just thank you so much for this great opportunity. Thank you so much, dear Lord, for those that have come to visit with us, dear Lord, and uh, for the first time, dear Lord, what a blessing to have them in your house to worship you in spirit and in truth, to join in this family of believers, dear Lord, to just say thank you, Lord, for another day that you've given us that we can worship you and honor you and praise you. The freedom that we have right now, dear Lord, uh, we don't take that uh, lightly, dear Lord, and we're not just here to check a box. We are here to praise you and honor you and worship you in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And God's people said... Amen. So if you've come and you want to give, you've come ready to give, uh, we have those slots in the uh, sides of the walls there, and there's a container out back. We're not passing around the uh, containers as we had done in the past for obvious reasons, right? But if you want to give that way, make sure when you leave here, you can drop it in the uh, slots there. God bless you. Let us continue to worship. Joyful sound of our offering 
As your saints bow down, as your people sing, we will rise with you, lifted on your wings, and the world will see that. Yes, the world will see that. Father God, as we come out of this this past week where we celebrated what you did for us, Father, in your death and resurrection, Lord, and it is so true that you saved. Father, you don't just save us from hell, as thankful as we are for that. Father, you save us from ourselves. You save us from so many things. Father, what a mighty God that you are, that you would love us, that you would give yourself for us. Father, and you give us a life. You give us a hope and a power far beyond ourselves, and we thank you and worship you for that today. And Lord, now I just pray that you would ready our hearts and our minds to receive your word. Father, as you speak your word through your servant, Pastor Nathaniel, to your people, Father, in the way that we need to hear this this morning, that we can obey it, live it out, apply it, Father, and take it out into our community spread the hope of a God that saves. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. Amen. So if you know me by now, you know that when it comes to the word of God, as a teacher, as a student, as a preacher of his word, I, I like to keep things simple. Sometimes as we look into scriptures, it, it seems confusing, complicated, and we find, our, find ourselves wrestling sometimes with some verses that we come upon or some passages that we come upon and statements that are made in the Bible that just our finite minds can't even begin to comprehend. And as we've been digging deeper into your favorite Bible verses, we, we come across very familiar verses of Scripture, some that really don't need any explanation, don't need to expound upon them as much, but yet there are some that we have to really, really let the Bible be its own commentary. Amen? But one thing that helps me to appreciate the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation is this one word that you've heard me mention quite often if you've been following us, and that word is relationship. Relationship. When, when we try to figure out this, this whole thing about God and, and uh, our Savior, it comes down to that very important word, relationship. From the very beginning, as, as you've heard me mention a number of times, that on day six, when God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, God had a plan with this special creation, a relationship unlike any of his other creation. God did not say, let us make light in our image, in our likeness. Let us make animals in our image, in our likeness. 
make the fowl of the air, none of, no other creation did God say, let us make in our image and in our likeness, but mankind. A special relationship. God knowing that man was going to mess up, Adam. And so God set it up because that relationship that was broken, wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death has passed upon all men, for all have sinned, according to Romans 5.12. But God had a plan. It began with that Old Testament or the Tanakh system, the teaching of the Torah, the law, where there was a sacrifice. There was an, an animal sacrifice. But then there was a man named Yeshua who came on the scene. And when John the Baptist saw him, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Bringing back that relationship. And so for today, church, someone had given me their favorite, favorite Bible verse found in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Let's dig deep into it. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy Acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So as always, we want to break it down, dig deeper into these verses, and see what these verses are saying so with that in mind, church, we're going to have to include the entire 12th chapter of Romans to get our context, to understand what these first two verses are saying to us. So it's broken down this way, again, talking about relationships. So verses 1 and 2 really is our relationship with God. Cross-reference that, of course, with Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Christ must have the preeminence in Colossians 1, 18. Our relationship not only to God, but that then carries over into our relationship to the church, to the body of Christ. And this chapter concludes with our relationship to our enemies. So let's break it down. Our relationship to God, again, Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, set apart, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Acceptable to God is key, obviously, in this. A sacrifice that is acceptable to God. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. That word transform is metamorpho, which is where we get the word what? Metamorphosis, right? A transformation. Our minds need to be transformed because our minds are now conformed to this world, this world system, this evil, this evilness that, that we, it, it, as I share with you often, this world is one big sin magnet, and we're just drawn to it. We're naturally drawn to it. But if any man be in Christ, he is a what? New creation. Old things are passed away and all things become new. And it begins with having a transformed mind that you may prove what is that good and, again, acceptable and perfect will of God. I love how the, the um, complete Jewish Bible gives us verse 1, because if, if you understand that whole process of sacrifice to a Jew, to say a, a sacrifice was, was 
a common thing for them to understand what Paul is saying here. I exhort you, therefore, brothers, in view of God's mercies, to offer yourselves as a sacrifice. Again, they understood the sacrificial system that was in place during that time, living and set apart for God, holy. This will please him. And I love where it says it is the logical temple worship for you. Again, going to that Jewish mindset, they understood the temple worship. They understood that sacrificial system that they were living in. Let's look at Leviticus chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Now, the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tabernacle of meeting, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When any one of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the livestock of the herd and of the flock. So a living sacrifice. Don't be bringing any dead sacrifices. The sacrifice was alive. You bring a living sacrifice. If his offering is a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish, again, acceptable unto God, he shall offer it of his own free will at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord. Then he shall put his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. And, of course, they did this year after year after year. It was something that they were used to. Began in the tabernacle, carried over into the temple. So when we read that this is your logical temple worship, understanding that the mindset of a Jew knew that sacrificial system and what, how, how, uh, how it meant to them, what it meant for them to hear that we're to present our bodies a living sacrifice, a sacrifice that is acceptable, a sacrifice that is set apart, a sacrifice that is pleasing to God. And, of course, having your mind renewed, making sure that you're no longer conformed to this world, because here's the most important thing that you need to understand. This deals with your relationship to God. If you're going to have a relationship to God, you must understand the importance of how we come to him. Giving up our lives to where it is acceptable to him. Learning what holiness is. We read in Ephesians chapter 4. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to walk, to work all uncleanliness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. That is one verse that jumped out at me early on in my Christian walk when I studied, began to study God's word and become a student of God's word. I love how Paul just put this in there. You have not so learned Christ. So all those things that we just read from verses 17 to verse 19, those things you did not learn from Christ. That is not what Christ teaches. You have not so learned Christ. Christ did not teach that. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Yeshua. The truth is in Jesus. So if you're going to learn something from the Lord, if he's going to teach you anything, he is going to teach you truth because the truth is in him. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? So here's what he teaches, that you put off concerning your former conduct, again, being transformed. The old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And be renewed 
in the spirit of your what, church? Of your mind. Again, we're talking about a relationship with God. You see, we can't come to God with a dirty mind, with filth and all that stuff in us, because we did not learn that from Christ. And that you put on the new man, which was created according to God, in true righteousness and what? Holiness. So we began Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, talking about our relationship to God. And when we have that right relationship to God, then we focus on our relationship to the church, to one another. And, and church, here, here's one thing that I am very passionate about. Because you, you've heard me sort of, sort of uh, uh, hit on some of the things that's going on in this world, all the, all the, the, the division that's happening around us. I'm not even going to talk about that anymore because... One thing that I know for sure, it is the church that needs to get it together. And the church said, there's a lot of division going on out there. But if there's going to be unity and peace and love, it is the responsibility of who? The church. And if you the church, we, the church, can present our bodies living sacrifice. We sacrifice our lives holy and acceptable to God. That relationship that we have with him by our minds being renewed, we can do the work of the church. Which begins in verse 3. For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, every single one of you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Again, having that renewed mind. It's not about me. It's all about him and how can I serve you. But to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith or a standard of faith, as Rabbi Barak Corman puts it. For as we have many members... In one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So I love how Paul just uses the, the human anatomy for, I mean, it's not hard to, to process that and understand what he's getting at here. We all have a body, and we all have many parts, and all these parts have different functions. So we being many are one body in Christ. The church. The body of Christ, we being many, but we are one body in Christ, Jew and Gentile, amen, and individually members of one another. Then he gets into the different gifts, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. Let us use our gifts. Now, my gift is, not, is no better than your gift. We don't go around comparing gifts. Whatever gift, whatever God has called you to, whatever service that God has called you to, guess what? It's important to the body of Christ. It's important to one another. So if you prophesy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or minister or serve, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So whatever gift that you have, it is for the church. How that we're to relate and how we're to serve the kingdom of God. But here's the thing. He goes on in verse 9 and says, let love be without hypocrisy. Cross-reference, 1 Corinthians, all of chapter 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love, it profits me, what church? Nothing. It is worthless. Useless. No matter what gift you may have, if love is not at the center 
it profits me nothing. So as he mentions these certain gifts in these last few verses, prior verses, previous verses, he says, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Hate what is evil. Despise what is evil and cling to what is what, church? Continuing on with the relationship to the church, the body, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. You see, when I'm serving you, church, I'm serving the Lord. When I'm serving the Lord, I'm serving you. Rejoicing in hope, and I love this, I should have had it highlighted, patient in tribulation. Be patient when you run into trouble, even among brethren. I mean, we're human. We make mistakes. I'm going to slip up from time to time. You're going to slip up from time to time. But I need to learn when it comes to the brethren, when it comes to the church, I need to learn to be patient in tribulation. I need to be patient with you. You need to be patient with me. Continuing steadfastly in what, church? In prayer. Distributing to the needs of the saints given to hospitality. This is the church. The church needs to get it together. Bless those who persecute you. Now, that word bless, you know where I'm going with this because I share it quite often, especially when, I, when I'm doing a funeral. I have one this, this coming Saturday. But that word bless in the Greek is the word eulogio. What word comes from that, our English word we use? Eulogy. And the only time we see eulogy is where? At a funeral. Never intended. That word was never intended for funerals. To bless someone is to speak well of someone, to say, to be kind, to say something uplifting to them. And we wait till they're in a coffin or in an urn to gather together and start saying nice things about them. Bless them now. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse, which is the opposite of bless. To, to bless is to speak well of someone. To curse is to speak evil of someone. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. I was meeting, meeting with someone this past week that's going through some hard times right now. I met with someone this past week that's going through some great things right now. And we need to learn how to rejoice with those who rejoice. I want to rejoice with you, my brother, my sister. And, of course, I want to weep with those who weep. We got to stay connected as the body of Christ. Thank you, Mountain View Church, for weeping with me and my family and rejoicing with us as well. Oh, that means a lot. Oh, that is uplifting. You just don't know how much we appreciate that. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on things on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. And then I love what he says in 1 Corinthians, or in Ephesians, rather. Goes right along with the bless. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good for, the, for necessary edification. Edification means to what, church? to build up. So every word that proceeds from your mouth is necessary for building up. That it may impart grace to the dead? No, to the what? To the hearers. If I'm going to be blessing someone, I want them to hear it. 
If I'm going to be uplifting someone, I want them to hear it. That person in that coffin is not going to hear it. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Well, how do you do that? Well, he says you let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind. To one another. That's the church. Tender hearted. Forgiving one another. Even as God in Christ. Forgave you. And we close out this. Point number two. With what the apostle John had to say. If someone says I love God. And hates his brother. John says he is a liar. Oh, I love God. But you hate your brother. You're lying. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? We come, become so spiritually minded, we're no earthly good. And this commandment we have from him. That he who loves God must love his brother also. That's the church. Our relationship to God the Father, as we present our bodies living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto him, which is our logical temple worship, having our minds renewed, having that transformation we can get it together with one another in our relationship. Because Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another the same way that I've loved you. That's how you're to love one another. This is how the world is going to know that you are my disciples. When the world sees that kind of relationship happening, they will know that you belong to me. When you love that way. Now the hard part, our relationship to our enemies. He says, back to Romans chapter 12. Repay no one evil for evil. That's easy preaching, but hard living. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Again, easy preaching, hard living. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. God said, you don't have to do anything. I'll go Rambo on him. You love Chuck Norris and Colonel Braddock? I'll be a Colonel Braddock. I'll go in and take care of him. Don't take matters into your own hands as we naturally try to do and want to do. But when our minds are being transformed, when we realize our relationship to God, I am to present my body as a living sacrifice. I am to be wholly acceptable unto him. I can't think like that anymore. I can't have that vengeful attitude anymore. Especially when it comes to the enemy. Someone who has done me wrong or done you wrong. Vengeance is mine. I will repay Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, <laughs> feed him. Really? Really? Oh, he don't really mean that. Yes. Feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. Yeah. I know you hate me. I know you've done me wrong, but I see that you're hungry. Here. Take my burger. Here, 
take my drink. I see that you're thirsty, even though you're evil, even though you've done me wrong, even though you have brought pain into my world. Here, man, have a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. And church, I love it. And, and, and Jay brought it out yesterday. So visiting the, uh, what is the name of your group on, 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 what is the name of it? How to wreck. How to wreck. So Ray, Ray Berryman, uh, they do the, the uh, Shabbat on Saturday, the how to wreck. And of course, Jay was uh, reading from, and this is a quote from Proverbs, by the way. Proverbs 25, is it? 21. And so he's, he's quoting from the Proverbs. Yeah, it's 25. Yeah. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. So some folk would think that, okay, well, wait a minute, you're saying to feed him and then to give him drink, but yet you're saying to heap coals of fire on his head. Wouldn't that cause pain? No, that, that's not how you interpret this. And I love, and, and so when he brought that up yesterday, I said, okay, okay, let me hear what he's going to say, what he's going to, and Jay, you nailed it, bro. You nailed it. Good job. Good job. So why would God's word say, feed him, give him drink, then turn around and heap coals of fire on his head to cause pain, to bring agony to him? So what does that mean? Well, I've heard some say that, you know, number one, how they would, would, would get warm, gather warmth during that time, on a, on a cold night, they, they would even put coals in, and fire in a bowl for warmth. Even they would put it on their head, and that warmth would just, just, just give them comfort. Heard that from, from, from a Jewish teacher. So the bottom line is you are to comfort your enemy, whether they're hungry, whether they're thirsty, or even if they're cold. You comfort your enemy. Do not be overcome by evil, and that is so easy to do. But if our minds are being renewed, if we're presenting our bodies as a living a sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, understanding what that meant, as far as the temple worship and relating to that, we do not overcome, be overcome by evil, but we overcome evil with what? With good. A couple of uh, 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 interesting observation here. A passage, and I don't know if you've seen uh, the, the second season of The Chosen, uh, 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 episode one, how many of you have seen episode one so far of The Chosen? <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to spoil it, but uh, uh, we, we watched it last, last Resurrection Sunday. It just blessed our heart. And, and, and there was a scene in there that focuses on these two uh, uh, disciples, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name for Norges, that is, sons of thunder. Jesus called them sons of thunder. So Luke picks it up in, in Luke chapter 9, verse, beginning at verse 51. Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up, him being Christ, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. Now, we know that relationship between Jews and Samaritans, they, uh, there was no relationship. They hated one another. The Jews had nothing to do with the Samaritans, or the Samaritans had nothing, wanted to have anything to do with the Jews. But the Samaritans did not receive him. The Samaritans did not receive Christ because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, these guys called sons of thunder, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? Lord, you want us to call down some fire? 
You want us to get them? Say, even when we know that we can't take matters into our own hands, we sometimes want God to be our attack dog. Get them, Lord. You say vengeance is mine. Get them. Sick in the dog on them. Sick them. God is not our attack dog. Lord, you want us to come down, call down fire to lap them up as Elijah did? Oh, you know that story of what Elijah did to all those false prophets, right? Lord, you want us to do the same? But you have not so learned Christ. Here's what Jesus taught. He turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are in. You are of. For the Son of Man did not come to what? Guys, as much as these people hate me, I didn't come to destroy them. As much as your enemy may hate you, and no matter what they've done to you, I didn't come to destroy them. I didn't come to destroy men's lives, but to what? To save them. Cross-reference that with the Gospel of John 3, 17. We know John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world. But John 3, 17 says that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. I came to save them, and they went another, to another village. So we come to the application. We've looked at our relationship to God, which is what Romans 12, 1 and 2 is all about, presenting our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable. That is our logical temple worship. Our minds must be renewed. We can no longer think like the world thinks because the world is all about revenge. The world is all about selfishness. The world is all about me, me, me. How can I get mine? Your mind needs to be renewed so you don't think like that. And when it comes to the body of Christ, the church, we need to get it together because this world is so divided. But if this world is going to see unity, what unity looks like, what peace looks like, it's going to be the light shining from the church. Let your light so shine that they may see your good works, your deeds. And of course, your relationship to the enemy. You know, when you treat an enemy with kindness, scratching their head. I don't get it. I've wronged this man. I've wronged this woman, but yet they're loving on me. What is that about? Talk about an opportunity to plant the seed and water the seed. So here's our application. Again, just quoting what, what Paul had written in Ephesians chapter 4, but you have not so learned Christ. Here's what Christ taught and continues to teach. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. You know where we're going with this, right? But I say to you, love, agape your enemies. Bless, speak well of those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Wow. This is Yeshua speaking, the, the, the Sermon on the Mount. At the beginning, he's teaching this crowd of how we're to live, how, to, how we're to, to interact with society. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. The beautiful thing about Yeshua is that he just didn't speak it, but he did it. He lived it. He was 
in fact, a doer of God's word. Amen? Because he was the word. He says, that you may be sons of your father in heaven. That's just a beautiful sign that you are a child of God. When you can love like that. For he makes his son, S-U-N, to rise on the evil and on the good. So as the sun is shining out there, it's not just shining on this property of believers in this building. And, it, and, and it's cloudy on the evil. Or raining on the evil. And sends rain on the just as the unjust. Do you not like that uh, character in Charlie Brown? Uh, it, it, was, was it uh, Pigpen? Walking around with a cloud of dust all the time? That's not God the Father. And so Jesus taught how we're to interact our relationship with God the Father and he made that possible by dying on the cross, redeeming us. But he left his disciples this beautiful message of what love looks like. So guys, you want to know what love looks like? Well, look how I love you. The same way that I love you, that's how you're to love one another. The church. The body. And when it comes to your enemies, need I say more? Love those who hate you. Pray for those that, despite, that spitefully misuse you and persecute you. Do good to them. Bless them. And I'm going to show you how. I'm going to show you what that looks like. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, Your word is clear. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 is beautiful. What a teachable moment for us as we break it down, understanding that it begins with that relationship with you, which carries over into the body, the church. Christ even asked the church at Corinth, a church that was divided, and he asked this very profound question. Is Christ divided? We know the answer to that is no. So to even hear of a church split <laughs> should never be in our vocabulary, should never, ever exist. Because the church, the body of Christ, the body of believers born in love. And Father, as difficult as it is, we have a responsibility in our relationship even to our enemies. Those who have wronged us, those who have persecuted us, those who have hated us. They hate us because of who we represent. But yet Jesus told his disciples, they're going to hate you because of me. Be prepared for that, guys. They're going to persecute you. They're going to throw you out of the synagogues. And to a Jew, that was, that, that was one thing that they did not want to see happen. And yet, Jesus died for the world that hated him. And still to this day, the power of God is changing the darkest and hardest of hearts to come to Jesus. And I pray, Father, that there is someone here today that has never made that decision to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for them. To believe that he was buried and to believe that you raised him from the dead. I pray, Father, that they will make that decision today. 
be welcomed into the family. And may we have the opportunity to not just welcome them, but to disciple them. For those that have tuned in today on, online, dear Lord, I pray that your word has gone forth and has been received with gladness and singleness of heart. I pray this. In that powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and God's people said, Amen. Amen. So there you have it, church, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. We're going to continue this on. I mean, we are into August now with your favorite Bible verses. And uh, so if you haven't turned anything in yet, keep it coming. Amen? Keep it coming. It's all right. It's all right. Crank it up. Crank it up. Hey, guys, let's stand. Thank you so much for fellowshipping with us. God bless you. Have a great week. See you next Sunday.